Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Shirad Jaitley from New York, your cardiologist uh, on MooneyMeterHealth.com, your favorite website, which is dedicated to spread the knowledge about the human heart and its illnesses around the globe. So thank you again for showing your enthusiastic interest and support uh, in this endeavor of mine uh, to educate freely to all and spread the, the knowledge about the heart to everyone across the world. We are on Facebook, as you know, as well as on YouTube, just for your FII. And of course, uh, I'm sure you're following on either of them, perhaps on both of them. So feel free and uh, use either of these channels to uh, look at my videos. Uh, as I always say, without any further ado, the subject of the matter, the matter of the heart today is uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, what is cardiogenic shock? And let's discuss that first. Uh, we'll have to define shock in a way that uh, normally it exists uh, in, our, in our setting, and how does it manifest? So cardiogenic shock implies that a sustained blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters mercury for at least over 30 minutes. So remember, blood pressure less than 90 millimeters for more than 30 minutes, you have to demonstrate that the cardiac output is low, at least it should be 2.2 millimeter uh, liters per minute, liters per minute per meter square and uh, show signs of uh, decreasing uh, renal function. So renal functions are progressively worsening. There are cold extremities, if you will. And of course, uh, uh, the urine output is declining and the mental state is changing. And the mental state is changing from full alertness to delirium. So. All of the cold extremities, urine output declining, and mental state declining, etc. So these are the major salient features of uh, cardiogenic shock by definition. What is the hemodynamic, uh, which is very important? What is the hemodynamics uh, of cardiogenic shock uh, by definition? One has to demonstrate that the cardiac output is low, obviously. So you can put a Swan GANS or assess it by uh, echo. You could see that that the cardiac output is low in the tune of 2.2 uh, liters per minute per meter square or less. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is high. Now that's a parameter which is uh, very important and we need to assess that because you could be hypovolemic, you could be dehydrated and the cardiac output could be low, blood pressure could be low. But the pulmonary capillary wedge is also low in that setting, it could be zero, one, two. When the pulmonary capillary wedge is high, that signifies that the left ventricular and diastolic pressures are high. Remember that. So this is a very, very important finding. Cardiac output, which is low, blood pressure, which is low, obviously, systolic blood pressure is low, and the pulmonary capillary wedge is high. And the third uh, part here is obviously you have, you have a peripheral hypoperfusion. So all signs of hypoperfusion, like cold extremities and uh, what have you, all these clinical parameters will be present hemodynamically as well. Now, what is the etiology of cardiogenic shock? Well, understand one thing that uh, predominantly uh, it is a result of a massive MI. So in a, an acute MI that has occurred, 75% uh, of the cases will have a massive MI, and those massive MIs will result into a cardiogenic shock. So this is the most important cause where we come across cardiogenic shock per se. The other important causes are, as a result, could be also because of an acute MI, or it could be because of other reasons, like an acute VSD, for instance. Now, VSD is developed because of, a, uh, because of a massive septal infarct, and that could be an acute VSD resulting into a cardiogenic shock. Um, or it could be an acute uh, MR that can develop, so mitral regurgitation that can develop, either because of papillary muscle uh, infarct or, um, or an infarct in the, in the belly of the pelly, uh, papillary muscle, uh, either of the papillary muscles within the left ventricle, or even the quality tendony, which could be infarcted. So acute MR can result, and a rupture of an acute uh, um, papillary muscle can result into an acute MR, and then patient goes into a cardiogenic shock. Other causes could be pericardial tamponade that can develop over a period of time. Uh, again, it could be resulting uh, from whatever reasons of tamponade. It could be a pericardial fusion, which has acutely developed and sent the patient to cardiogenic shock. It could be an aortic aneurysm, which could have um, dissected and now resulting to a tamponade and cardiogenic shock, or it could be an acute MI resulting to a cardiogenic shock from pericardial tamponade. 
decompensated heart failure. Remember, this is a very, very important uh, cause, but remember heart failures can be decompensated, but they can go into a significant cardiogenic shock when the LVEF, or ejection fraction, could be less than 10% or 15%, if you will. The cardiac output drops rather dramatically, uh, drastically. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure starts rising, hypoperfusion will develop, and the cardiac output could be extremely low. Now remember, many of the decompensated heart failures or compensated heart failures also can have blood pressures of about 80, 85, and they could be functional. They could be walking from room to room with the help of a walker, a cane, etc. So that's commonly seen. So if it's a new drop in blood pressure in a compensated heart failure to less than 90, say you know, normally that heart failure patient was walking around with a pressure of 100 over uh, 70 or something. And now all of a sudden in the last, uh, say, several hours, the patient's got pressures of less than 90. That's a decompensation and the patient is approaching the guidelines of uh, the definitions of cardiogenic shock in that setting or impending shock rather, if you will. And then you have to just demonstrate the other part like decreasing renal functions, decreasing cardiac output, and then a patient could be assessed uh, to have cardiogenic shock at that point. Now, the, uh, medical therapy clearly implies that if the patient is hypovolemic, you want to give IV fluids. So you want to give an IV fluid support here. Uh, the colloids and fluids, etc., can be given. Now, uh, but you have, but it's not free of danger. So you must put a pulmonary, uh, a pulmonary arterial catheter or swan gans, we call it. A swan gans is very helpful. And then, of course, uh, an echo is helpful. Um, and, of course, uh, ECG and chest X-ray is also very helpful. So these are the basic uh, testings that will be done by bedside and uh, patients admitted to the ICU-CCU settings. Um, so swan gans, uh, pulmonary capillary wedges can be monitored while you're giving the fluids and the wedges start increasing. You know you don't need more fluids. Then all you need is uh, um, to support uh, the pressure. You need inotropes. So, so positive inotropy is very helpful, and I would use... Uh, um, all, uh, all anotropic drugs, including dibutamine and, and dopamine. Dopamine really for pressure purposes and dibutamine really for cardiac output because it's a vasodilator as well, peripherally and after load reduces in short-term basis. However, these anotropic agents do have intermediate and long-term mortality, so therefore they could be used only for about two to three days the max. The max I've used it about five days in my clinical practice. So just remind yourself that inotropes can be only for short-term benefits, but they're very, very helpful indeed. No question about that. Now, once you establish the pressures are rising and you have stabilized the hemodynamics here and you know that the wedges are now ranging between 10 and 12 and you've been able to ascertain that, then you may preferably use some diuretics and uh, try to see if you can get some uh, renal functions going and uh, urine output uh, improving. And once the urine output improves, then you have making some headway and you can start weaning, you know, t uh, you're dialing these inotropes down, and of course, IV fluids are only maintenance and support. That's all. You may require a ventilatory support depending upon uh, what the oxygenation is uh, looking like, but ventilatory support is again temporary only to tide you over uh, during, uh, during these aspects. Um, Intraaortic balloon pump is uh, highly required, uh, specifically if all of these medical me measures fail, then you should put an intraaortic balloon pump. Now, the uh, the hemodynamics of the intraaortic uh, balloon pump uh, is, is very, very simple. Basically, it uh, deflates in systole and inflates in diastole. So as a result, the coronary perfusion will improve. And uh, uh, once the coronary perfusion improves, uh, um, it also decreases the afterload, uh, uh, afterload uh, on the patient. So afterload reduction and a coronary perfusion are the two ways as to how the intraaortic balloon pump works. So in a nutshell, cardiogenic shock manifests with these parameters. Hemodynamics are these. Pulmonary VEG typically is more than 15. Cardiac output is low and hypoperfusion states persist. Urine output is declining over a period of time and a sustained low blood pressure. Um, remember, acute VSDs and acute MR should go immediately to the OR for repairs. Tamponades will require pericardiocentesis uh, on an emergent basis. Uh, by bedside, sometimes in the war, and a massive uh, MI should be addressed with revascularization, so an immediate angiogram and a revascularization, preferably multiple stents and or bypass may be necessary in addition with an intraaortic balloon pump assist. So all of this is, can, be uh, can be treated, uh, but it requires obviously uh, quick assessment 
of quick uh, evaluation and then finding the immediate etiology as to what uh, uh, leads uh, the person to develop a cardiogenic shock in a, in a sudden setting. And an echo is very helpful because that will help diagnose pretty much all these three or four conditions which are very, very important in cardiogenic shock uh, uh, development. I once again thank you for your interest in watching MoneyMeterHealth.com. So continue watching on Facebook and YouTube. These are your two um, uh, video channels that we are featuring on and uh, continue uh, uh, putting questions and comments. And of course, if you like this video, do press the like button and let me know uh, your comments, please. I thank you again for your interest. Until then, uh, so long. Dr. Shiraj Jaitley from New York.